About four years ago, I was coming home on a Friday night, and I decided to watch some TV. And I'll admit that I may not have been completely sober, and I might have been a bit emotional, but I didn't realize at the time that what I was about to watch would change me. What I was about to watch would take me to a place I did not think possible. What I ended up watching, I ended up watching a documentary about how people in Southeast Asia were eating insects. Now, that's nothing new. People have been eating insects for thousands of years, and if things go the way I think, people are going to keep eating insects for thousands of years. But that's not what fascinated me. What fascinated me is why people were doing it, not just in Southeast Asia, but how people across the globe were choosing to switch out regular meat for insects. That little hook, just that little thing, would take me... I, did not I, I would never have believed it was possible. But don't worry, though. I'm not here to try and convince you to eat insects. I have no intention of eating insects. It's not happening. What I would like to talk about is how much we eat, especially how much meat we eat, and where that meat comes from, how we produce it. And how I believe, in the future, you will all find yourself a willing part of a rather strange food chain. But before I talk about how how we eat meat, how we can do it better. I need to talk about where we are now. So I need to talk about some statistics. So you just got to bear with me. There's some numbers coming, but I'm going to explain everything. This is how much meat we eat every year. So this is chicken, pork, and beef. In 2013, we were eating a staggering 259 million tons of meat as a planet. It's a massive number, so many zeros. And it's going to keep growing over the next 10 years. I mean, we're going to keep eating meat. But that number, though, 259 um, million tons, that's too big to comprehend. What, uh, what does that really look like? I mean, it's way too big. So let's try and quantify that. In sub-Saharan Africa, on average, we eat nine kilos of meat a year. Now, that's nothing. Like, to use an extremely unscientific method, that's about as much as my lower leg. Now, I've got skinny legs, so I'm giving myself nine kilos. <laughs> but what about where, somewhere else in the world? Let, let, let's look at China. How much does it, how much the Chinese eat per person? Meat. The Chinese are eating 65 kilos. <laughs> That's almost a whole me, just in chicken, pork, and beef. That's a lot. But that's still not a lot on the grand scale. Let's go to our friends in America. 120 kilos of meat a year. That's almost two me's, <laughs> just in meat. That's an, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of meat. But it's not just meat we're eating, you know, the, the classic meats. We're also eating a lot of fish. According to the UN, of the 600 populations of fish across the globe, three quarters of those are either depleted, so there's nothing left, they're being overfished, so we're actually you know, fishing juveniles, or they're at a level where no matter how many boats we throw in, we're not getting any more fish. That's over three quarters. So we're eating a lot of meat, we're eating a lot of fish, but how are we getting to that point? What are we putting in there to produce this meat? A lot of water goes into the meat we produce. A lot of water. Right? And this is not just water to feed the animals, but this is water to go in the crops that they eat. So the grains, the barleys, all that. For every kilo of beef, you can use as much as 15,000 liters. That's per kilo. And the numbers for pork and chicken are also pretty high. We're talking about thousands of liters. And now these numbers are for industrialized farming. So this is where we're heading. This is where they put the animals in small containers. They don't get out to go outside. You know, they're probably not very happy. But to, be to continue eating meat the way we eat meat, this is probably where we're going to go. Now, I mentioned the grains that they eat. So the most important part of those grains is protein. Where do they get the stuff that makes them grow? A lot of the protein that animals are eating is coming from soy meal, cotton seed, but we're also feeding fish meal to our animals, especially to farm fish. Now, when we're dealing with farm fish, fish meal is especially evil. There's a ratio um, when we're looking at how to farm fish and how much... Um, why do I keep doing that? Okay. 
It's called fish in, fish out. Now, fish in, fish out means how many kilos of wild fish it takes to produce one kilo of farm fish. The biggest, uh, the biggest criminal is, is salmon. For every one kilo of farm salmon, it takes two kilos of wild fish in the form of fish meal. Two kilos for every one kilo of farm salmon. For prawns, it's almost as bad, one and a half kilos. Now, this is us. Now, remember what I said about we're overfishing to feed fish to fish so that we can eat them. I mean, that's, that's a bit strange, isn't it? So we're eating lots of fish, we're eating lots of meat, we know we're overfishing the oceans, you know, and after all of this you know, production, all of this pro food produced for human consumption, we're actually throwing out a lot of it. As a planet, we average, we're throwing out a third of what we produce for human consumption, a third. That totals to 1.3 billion tons of food wasted a year. And if I was to go back to the measure of me, I mean, that's 18 million me's. Now, I like myself, but 18 million for me even is a bit, that's, that's a bit much. But I'm going to try and quantify it again, because that number, 18 million, it, again, it doesn't, doesn't make much sense. So how about the average person? The average person consumes about, or there's food produced for that person, 600 kilos a year. 600 kilos. Now, in terms of me, that's eight and a half, eight and a half me's just in food. Eight and a half, that's a lot. But of that eight and a half, I will throw out a third. I will throw out as many as almost three me's in the bin, just wasted in a year. So, I mean, that, 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 that's just crazy. Three me's just in the bin. So let's do, a, let's do a quick recap here. We're eating lots. We're using a lot of water to grow the grains that we feed our crops. We're overfishing for, for, for fish meal. And we're, we're throwing it in the bin. But why is that important? What does that mean to you, me, everybody in this crowd? What does that have to do with my, you know, my documentary watching on a Friday night? How have I developed a relationship, a strange relationship with an insect? I would like to show you what's underneath here. What's underneath here is a solution to all of those problems I mentioned. What's underneath here is something that you've all seen, but you didn't know what it was. What's under here has been here long before we were here, and it will be here long after we've gone. But before I take off the cover, I want you to listen to something. We can get some volume. This is what's underneath here. Not very loud. <laughs> I would like to introduce you to my babies. These, ladies and gentlemen, are the larvae of what is known as Hermetia inusens, or the black soldier fly. These larvae here are about 10, days, 10 to 14 days old. They've turned black. When they're younger and when they're eating, they're still clear. But these guys, because they're not trying to, um, at this stage, they're not trying to escape, I chose these for the glass bowl, otherwise we might have some, uh, we might have some issues, with some larvae want it running wild. But at this stage, they're actually clean, and you can even handle them. It's an amazing feeling. I'm telling you, it is so intense. I, if you want to try it, they're here afterwards. <laughs> so once they're at this stage, you know, they've done their eating, um, they're going to go off, find a nice place to lie down, and they're going to pupate. Once they're done pupating, they turn into what is known as a black soldier fly. Now, black soldier flies are wasp imitators. You can tell them from the two windows in the lower part of their body. They're, like a, they're about an inch long, they're, they're rather large, and they do look a bit dangerous. They're wasp imitators but they, they don't have a mouth, they don't have a sting. You know, and in actual fact, you know, they're quite friendly. They're really friendly, and they're not scared of you at all. I mean, they will come, you can hold them, they don't try and fly away. I like them, I mean, these are, th 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 these are my children. But why does this matter? Why does my strange relationship with this larvae, how is it going to fix all of those problems I mentioned? This guy here, when he's eating, here, he, him and she, when they're eating, they are prolific eaters. They will eat their body, waste, their body weight in waste every day for 14 days. Now, while that doesn't seem like much, you know, when you have 500 to 1,000 brothers and sisters, that's a lot of food. I mean, if I was eating my own body weight in waste today, I might be a little bit fatter, but I'd also be dead. Like, it's not going to, it wouldn't work. I mean, they are, they're, they're amazing eaters. I mean, they will go through any organic waste. 
And they do choose the freshest stuff, but eh, if you ask me, they're not that fussed. But again, why does this matter? How are these going to solve that problem? How is this little fatty going to solve that problem? This guy at this stage, his body content is 45% protein. 45. That has, that's one of the highest levels of protein in the animal kingdom. And that number, 45, is important because that's the same number as soy meal. That's the same number as fish meal. The current, how our, our livestock today, how they get their protein. This little guy here, once we dry him, crush him, he is a sustainable insect-derived protein. All of them. Like, we can use these guys to, to replace soy and to replace fish meal. But so what? So let's start. Let's, if, we can, if we can use them to replace them, what's the big deal? The big deal is soy and fish meal, they retail for about $1,200 a ton. This guy here, half that. Half that. We can provide sustainable insect-derived protein to households in Tanzania, households where a lot of people keep chickens, a lot of people keep, keep, keep pigs and cattle in their backyard, and we can allow them to provide food at half the price. So why aren't we doing this? You know, what's, the, what's, what's the reason? What's holding us back? Two reasons. When, when you see this, what do you think? Yes, exactly. Nobody thinks, ooh, I want to cuddle them and let's get, let's get closer. <laughs> That's the main problem. Are we, are we comfortable with it feeding an animal that's been living in waste to an animal that we're going to then eat. Well, we should be. I mean, chickens eat maggots all the time. But perception is not quite there yet. As a, We have issues with knowing where our food is coming from. We, we do. And that's also what leads to the second problem, that waste. Because if that waste has disease, what happens when that disease goes from the pile of waste to the larvae, to the chicken, and into, the, into a human being? That's a problem getting around that circle, ensuring that the waste is clean. But there are people doing this. They're doing it in South Africa, they're doing it in the States, and they're doing it in Tanzania. I'm oh, sorry, they're doing it in Europe. What about Tanzania? What about Tanzania? When I first watched that documentary four years ago, I was living in a cold, cold country. I mean, so cold. I was so cold, I lost all of the brown in me. I changed color, it was so cold. And these guys here, they need warm. They need 27 degrees. See, it's 27 degrees outside. They like this environment. They're native to, the, to Tanzania. So when I came back to Tanzania last year, after four years in the cold, I'd almost forgotten about these guys. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't live my dream because the climate there where I was living was way, it just not, wasn't going to happen. So I came back to Tanzania last year, and I was, you know, I, I, a lot of people have compost here, and I had my compost, you're throwing it out, and I went to go put, you know, something into my compost, and I opened the bin, and I saw these things moving. And I mean, in two seconds, I was, I was in there, you know, and it was like a eureka moment. I mean, I, they, they had found me. Like, I didn't even have to go and find them. They'd found me. I mean, it was amazing. I get, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. They had actually found me. So, I mean, this started a, a whole new um, a path for me. But I was still at the same problem. You know, how do we fix the, the waste issue? We can't take this to the dar dump, you know, throw these in the dump and then start feeding it to chickens. Mm, it's a bit... Mm. And then I bumped into a man who, who has access to clean waste, who has access to waste which comes from a factory that produces food for human consumption. And not just a little bit of waste. I mean, we're talking more waste... I mean, mountains of this stuff comes out of this factory every day. It was, I mean, meeting this man was like, you know, if he, if he wasn't married, I'd have married him on the spot. <laughs> we, we, we had, you know, I had, you know, we had the idea, we had the waste. I challenge you, next, by this time next year, I'll be able to invite you to a barbecue where we can feed you chicken that's been fed on these. It's happening. I'm going to show you these guys, but these guys are a little bit more gross because these guys are still eating, and that's why they're in a sealed box, because they are notorious escape artists. So but I'm going to put something in here. This is just mango. And if you guys want, you can come around later, and you can see what these guys have done to the mango in the short space of time that, um, uh, that we're here today. 
I'm just going to try and throw it in there quickly enough and then close the jar. Close the lid. There. Okay. There we go. But come around later. And, l I mean, have a look. Have a look at them eating. They are fascinating creatures. Today, we're, <laughs> we're eating meat in an unsustainable way. You know, we're feeding you know, grains to our, to, to our livestock, which are consuming the planet's resources. We're feeding our, our, our farm fish, but with fish meal that's causing us to overfish the oceans, like we're depleting our resources. And after all this, we're producing mountains of waste every day. We're throwing out the food. Like, why are we doing this? I mean, there's, there's ways around it. You know, I, I, I say, you know, take away those water-relying crops and provide our livestock with, with their protein from sustainable insect-derived protein. You know, stop overfishing the oceans and replace fish meal with sustainable insect-derived protein. You know, take away the mountains of waste, give it to, 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 to these larvae, and provide our livestock with sustainable insect-derived protein. I mean, did I say sustainable? I don't think. I mean, this is like we need a, I almost need to stand up here and, you know, we need to chant this, you know, sustainable. sustainable. Yeah, I like you. <laughs> yeah. Gold star. But all in all, we can do this. We can, we can really make a change about the way we, we live on this planet. And we can leave less of a footprint so that people can go forward and actually, you know, uh, long after us, uh, can continue to eat meat. Because I'm not stopping to eat meat. I'm not going vegetarian. Not happening. <laughs> but we can do this. But ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to give a warm round of applause for the absolute star, the real hero, the, the fly that is willing to die for you and keep you eating meat. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, the black soldier fly.